The next example we will look at is the Shepherd of Hermas. In every collection of the Apostolic Fathers, one will find a writing called the Shepherd by Hermas. This famous document of early Christianity was written by a Roman named Hermas, who is considered one of the Apostolic Fathers. The document is usually dated about 140 to 155 AD. Early church writer Origen, however, was of the opinion that this Hermas was the same Hermas whom St. Paul greets in his Epistle to the Romans, chapter 6, verse 14. Nevertheless, the document is usually dated about the middle of the second century. In the Shepherd of Hermas, we find this interesting passage about the Bishop of Rome, Clement. Hermas, the Shepherd for approximately 140 A.D., quote, You shall therefore write two little books and send one to Clement. Clement shall send it to the cities abroad, for that is his duty, end quote. Notice that Hermas says that Clement, who was the fourth Bishop of Rome, had a responsibility to send things to the other churches. In this ancient document, we see that Clement's duty involved a responsibility for the universal church, a care for the universal church. The next example we will look at also comes from the second century and the Easter controversy. Victor threatens to excommunicate the churches of Asia over the Easter controversy. In the ancient Christian church, the name Polycarp is very important. Polycarp was born in approximately 69 A.D., and he became the Bishop of Smyrna. In Book 5, Chapter 20 of his Ecclesiastical History, Eusebius tells us that Polycarp knew the Apostle John himself and those who had seen the Lord. For this reason, St. Polycarp was regarded with great respect in the early church. He eventually suffered a heroic martyrdom for the faith in approximately 155 A.D., but a year before his martyrdom, Polycarp traveled to Rome and had a conference with the Pope of that time, Pope Anicetus. Polycarp went to see Anicetus, the Bishop of Rome, about a controversy which swirled over when Easter was to be celebrated by Christians. In the second century, the church at Rome and many other churches celebrated Easter on the Sunday which followed the fourteenth day of the Jewish month Nisan. The churches of Asia, however, of which Polycarp was a bishop, celebrated Easter on the fourteenth day of Nisan, regardless of whether it was a Sunday. Eusebius and Irenaeus tell us about Polycarp's trip to Rome and his meeting with Anicetus. Quote, about this time, when Anicetus was at the head of the Roman church, Irenaeus said that Polycarp, who was yet living and coming to Rome, had a conference with Anicetus on a question respecting the day of Passover. End quote. So St. Polycarp, who had known the Apostle John, had a conference with Pope Anicetus on the Easter question. Even though they didn't wind up agreeing on the matter, Pope Anicetus and Polycarp communed. Apparently Anicetus didn't see the matter as dogmatic. But why would St. Polycarp, who was then a very old man, travel almost 1,000 miles to Rome to see the Bishop of Rome about the Easter controversy? The answer is that the Roman Church and the Roman Bishop held supreme authority. Polycarp's trip to Rome shows the great authority and respect which was due to the Bishop of Rome, for he was the successor of St. Peter. A few decades later, in approximately 190, the reigning Pope was Victor. Victor considered the Easter issue to be more serious than Anicetus did. We are told by early church historian Eusebius, that when Victor received a letter from the bishops of Asia about their views on when to celebrate Easter, Victor endeavored to cut off, to excommunicate all of the churches of Asia over the issue. Eusebius, Ecclesiastical History, Book 5, Chapter 24, quote, Upon this, Victor, the bishop of the Church of Rome, endeavored to cut off the churches of all Asia, together with neighboring churches, as unorthodox from the common unity, and he published abroad by letters and proclaimed that all the brethren there were wholly excommunicated. But this was not the opinion of all the bishops. They immediately exhorted him, on the contrary, to contemplate that course that was calculated to promote peace, unity, and love to one another. Among these also was Irenaeus, who in the name of those brethren in Gaul over whom he presided, wrote an epistle in which he admonished Victor not to cut off whole churches of God who observed the tradition of an ancient custom. End quote. Notice that Eusebius, who lived in the 3rd and 4th centuries and was the historian of the primitive church, 
acknowledges that Victor believed he had the authority to excommunicate all the churches of Asia. This is very interesting. It's also fascinating that no one questions Victor's authority to do this. Rather, Irenaeus and the others implored Victor not to exercise this authority. They disagreed with the course of action, but did not question his authority to take it. In fact, we will hear shortly from Irenaeus on the authority of the Church of Rome. If any other bishop of this period had threatened to excommunicate whole churches, the notion would have been absurd. In this case, it caused a huge controversy because it was the Bishop of Rome. Apparently, Victor was persuaded by bishops such as Irenaeus not to cut off the churches of Asia. In exhorting him not to excommunicate the churches of Asia, Irenaeus pointed out that the past bishops of Rome tolerated their custom on this matter. This whole incident reveals where the center of church life resided in this period of the primitive church, that is, in Rome. It should also be noted that the letter which was sent to Victor by the bishops of Asia, in which they expressed their different view on the Easter question, was written by the bishop Polycrates. Polycrates spoke for the churches of Asia on the Easter question. In his letter to Victor, which Eusebius quotes in Book 5, Chapter 24, Polycrates says this, quote, I could also mention the bishops who were present, whom you requested to be summoned by me. End quote. Notice, this means that Victor directed Polycrates to summon the other bishops of Asia to their council. As one commentator put it, quote, According to this, the Asiatic Council was summoned at the request of Victor of Rome. So this shows us again the supreme authority of the Bishop of Rome and how it was acknowledged even at this early stage of the primitive church. The Easter controversy was eventually resolved around the time of the Council of Nicaea, with everyone adopting the custom of the Church of Rome. The next example we will look at comes from St. Irenaeus. St. Irenaeus was born and raised near Smyrna in approximately 135. Irenaeus was taught by the famous Polycarp, whom we've already mentioned. Irenaeus eventually came west and became the head bishop in Gaul, what is now France. Irenaeus is a major figure of the ancient church, and he provides us with one of the most important citations on the early recognition of papal primacy and jurisdiction. St. Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 3, Chapter 3, Approximately 180 A.D. Quote, Since, however, it would be very tedious in such a volume as this to reckon up the successions of all the churches, we do put to confusion all those who assemble in unauthorized meetings. We do this, I say, by indicating that tradition derived from the Apostles, of the very great, the very ancient, and universally known Church, founded and organized at Rome by the two most glorious Apostles, Peter and Paul, and also by pointing out the faith preached to men, which comes down to our time by means of the successions of the bishops. For it is a matter of necessity that every Church should agree with this Church, that is, of Rome, on account of its preeminent authority, that is, the faithful everywhere." End quote. In 180 AD, in this citation, St. Irenaeus describes the church at Rome as the most important church in the universal church. He specifically says that the faithful everywhere must of necessity agree with the church at Rome because of its preeminent or superior authority. Thus, St. Irenaeus not only indicates that Rome has the primacy among the churches, but that it has a primacy of universal authority or jurisdiction. This contradicts the so-called Eastern Orthodox view, which rejects a primacy of jurisdiction. St. Irenaeus thus expresses Catholic truth on the papacy. It should also be noted that many of the fathers, such as Irenaeus, emphasize the fact that not just St. Peter, but also St. Paul, died in Rome. Some of them speak of the succession at Rome from Peter and Paul. There is no doubt that God had it arranged that both Peter, the head of the church, and Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, would die in Rome. This would leave no doubt that it was the church slash bishop of Rome which would be the center of church life. This was important because St. Peter was also originally at Jerusalem and at Antioch, but he ended his life as the bishop of Rome. So God made sure that St. Paul died there as well to remove any doubt that anyone might have about which church inherited the universal authority. It would leave no doubt that the authority of the keys, 
which was to preside over all of the Gentile lands which would be converted, would be governed from Rome. It's interesting that many papal documents, in which popes use the fullness of the authority which was given to St. Peter, use language such as this, quote, By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and by our own authority, we declare, end quote. This shows us that the infallible papal authority which was exercised by popes down through history has its origin and its link with what happened in Rome in the time of the apostles. Other things from the second century could be covered, but we must move on. St. Cyprian and the Rebaptism Controversy Moving on to the third century, we come to St. Cyprian and the Rebaptism Controversy. St. Cyprian was the famous bishop of Carthage in Africa. Like Origen, Tertullian, and the others of this period, Cyprian acknowledged that Peter was made the prime apostle. In 252, Cyprian wrote the pope of the time, Cornelius. Cyprian's letter to Cornelius clearly shows that he acknowledged the primacy of the bishop of Rome and that Rome was the principal church. Quote, With false bishops appointed for themselves, they dare even set sail and carry their letters from schismatics and blasphemers to the chair of Peter and to the principal church, that is Rome, in which sacerdotal unity has its source. Nor do they take thought that these are Romans, whose faith was praised by the apostle, to whom heretical faith cannot have access." End quote. While it's true that St. Cyprian didn't always express a precisely correct view on what the chair of Peter is, in this letter we see that he acknowledges Rome as the principal church, the church from which priestly unity has its source. His words are similar to Tertullian's words which we've quoted where Tertullian says that the authority of his church also derives from the Church of Rome. In this letter from Cyprian to Cornelius, we also see the roots of papal infallibility. He says that heretical faith cannot have access to the Church of Rome. As we will see, this concept of the Church of Rome being without spot or error is repeatedly expressed in the early Church. It's a continuation of what was promised to Peter in Luke 22. Just a few years later, St. Cyprian did have a famous disagreement with Pope St. Stephen, who was the second to reign after Cornelius. This dispute was called the Rebaptism Controversy. Cyprian and the African bishops held that heretics couldn't validly baptize. They held that this was from apostolic tradition. Thus, they held that those baptized among heretics should be rebaptized. Pope Stephen held the contrary view and forbade a rebaptism for those who had been baptized in the name of Christ or the Trinity. Cyprian was wrong that heretics couldn't validly baptize. Heretics can validly baptize if they use the proper form. But what's particularly interesting about this is that Bishop Firmilian of Caesarea, who was another bishop who agreed with Cyprian on rebaptism, wrote the following to Cyprian. Firmilian of Caesarea to Cyprian, 255, quote, I am justly indignant at this so open and manifest folly of Stephen, who announces that he holds by succession the throne of Peter. He is stirred with no zeal against heretics." End quote. This shows that Firmilian, Cyprian, and obviously Stephen himself acknowledged that Stephen succeeded to the authority of Peter. He succeeded to the throne of the one who was appointed the head of the church. Though Cyprian strongly disagreed with Stephen on the point of rebaptism, and was wrong. After his death, Cyprian communicated with the next pope, Sixtus II. It should also be noted that in 254, when Stephen was still reigning, Cyprian had requested Pope Stephen to excommunicate and remove the heretical bishop of Arles, Martianus, from his position. Cyprian to Stephen, 254 to 257, quote, Let letters be directed by you into the province and the people abiding at Arles, by which Martian being excommunicated, another may be substituted in his place. Intimate plainly to us who has been substituted at Arles in the place of Martian, end quote. found in Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume 5, pages 368 and 369. This shows us that Cyprian acknowledged the preeminent authority of Stephen as successor of Peter, even though he later disagreed with him on the rebaptism issue. Thank you.